Thanks again, Sally. Thanks, Steve, for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be in front of a very varied audience that I think that comes both from the application side as well as the data analytics. Because I do believe that uh, dealing with a large data set of many different kinds, but in particular data that are collected by physical sensors, they do need the cooperation between many sides of sciences. Needs the domain application person that understand the physics or whatever the phenomenon that is uh, be, uh, beyond the, the data that we collect, as well the uh, data analytics one. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in seismology. And uh, uh, in the past few years, there have been a very fast development of seismic sensors. And that uh, has to do both with the cost, with power consumption, with a uh, potential of being able to deploy it in very varied configuration. And uh, uh, that, uh, I believe, it is making a, a huge difference in seismology. And in particular, when we just listen to what Earth has to tell us, not when we stimulate the Earth with active sources. I should say that I do come from the active source side of seismic surveying. Uh, that is uh, my day job, just to tell you the kind of the level of effort. I have about 15, 17 PhD students. And uh, at every time, I, I had in the past few years one or two students working on passive data. But I do think that uh, that may increase, because there are indeed a lot of opportunities there. I'm uh, uh, going to talk mostly about uh, using uh, uh, dense sensors arrays to monitor subsurface processes. Uh, and uh, uh, the, all the data and all the results that I'm going to show you uh, is really uh, produced by Shor de Ritter, that uh, was a student of mine until a few months ago. Now he moved uh, to Hefei, China, to be a junior faculty at USTC. And uh, uh, what is beyond the results uh, that are more the speculation uh, and uh, the abstract thinking that is probably not necessarily correct. That is due to me, and I am the one to blame. But uh, the good results are short, not mine. So uh, what uh, uh, active seismic surveying is a big data industry. I don't think that there are many questions about that. Though you may see there that uh, the big data is in lower case. Uh, so indeed, uh, we do collect a large amount of data, uh, like uh, by modern seismic boards, like the one on the right, that uh, they pull 10, 15 uh, streamers with a lot of sensors. The most modern uh, seismic boards, they have about 100,000 sensors collecting uh, at a, a rate of two milliseconds per sample. If you make a simple math, it's about 20 terabytes uh, of data a day. And since they are expensive boards, they go on 24 hours a day. And uh, uh, there are about 90 of them in the world operational, not of the top ones. Well, what I just the number that I gave you is the top one. But this is, uh, is a uh, arm race uh, among the geophysical uh, contractors. So they will upgrade to that kind of numbers pretty soon. And the top one will get larger numbers. That has to be expected. And uh, that is for marine uh, surveying. For land surveying, is about collecting the same amount of data as uh, for marine. So you need to put a factor of two. So that is uh, uh, active seismic surveying. Though uh, in the past 10 years, uh, as uh, sensors have become uh, uh, cheaper, uh, companies have been deploying uh, uh, large, dense arrays of permanent uh, sensors. Uh, so far, they have been justified in terms of cost based on the repeated active surveying. So these two sensors array that are uh, shown here on the slide, uh, they are in the North Sea, and uh, they really uh, pay the, uh, for themselves by every three, six months having an active surveying and understanding how the reservoir is changing, uh, and uh, uh, then optimizing the production. But they have a regional amount of number of sensors, again, 10,000 from the one on the left, 16,000 for the one on the right, that is fiber optic uh, sensing. And uh, uh, since we are there, we ask companies uh, to say, what about if you collect data 
uh, not uh, just when you're shooting, but uh, uh, when uh, there is nothing going on. And that is somewhat is what started uh, our projects there. And uh, I'm going to talk about how to use that kind of passive data to monitor subsurface processes. This can be applied for conventional oil and gas reservoir, but can also apply for unconventional uses like monitoring CO2 sequestration uh, project. And indeed, uh, GSAP was very generous a, a couple of years ago to support some of the work that I am going to, uh, to show. Another very important application of uh, passive seismic uh, sensors is the one of micro seismic. Uh, in particular, that uh, I think that will have a huge impact when it's in conjunction with hydraulic fracturing, frac, fracking, that's probably, uh, you ever heard of that term, for unconventional oil and gas reservoirs, sometimes they're called shale gas. And not only can improve economics, but uh, can actually decrease the number of wells, decrease the numbers of frac jobs, and so we have much less of an impact on the environment, less use of fresh water, less production of uh, wastewater. Now, that's it from the industry side. There are potential uh, great application on the earthquake seismology side. At the end, I have a slide about that. I just noticed that my colleague Greg Berosa is sitting there in the corner, and uh, he has been leading uh, of those efforts, there is a potential of a, a real-time earthquake detection. And uh, if you do uh, be able to detect an earthquake that is happening in real time, you can shut off a lot of infrastructure, save lives, and uh, save infrastructure. That is a huge impact. As well, a more scientific one, uh, you can start to uh, using big data uh, Analysis try to see the kind of earthquakes that uh, they have been called in that community tremors that uh, are not apparent from uh, kind of smaller data conventional seismic application and that does uh, give us more insights on earthquake mechanism and potentially understanding and uh, uh, maybe even predicting earthquakes. So that's the application. Uh, let me go instead to what uh, uh, the main uh, topic of my talk that has to do with. Uh, passive seismic interferometry for uh, reservoir scale imaging. And uh, uh, it's really uh, made by two uh, steps. The first one is transforming the noise that is always going on in the Earth to uh, what we call virtual sources. So what is look like and coherent noise, now we transform in coherent data in which uh, then uh, we can transform in estimation of parameters, in particular, for example, seismic velocities. So the first part has a, st a statistical data analysis component that uh, that is type to bring the big data with uh, uh, capital uh, letters. Uh, in uh, seismic imaging, that is the next step, we do use statistics. And maybe we abuse it sometime. But it really is driven uh, by understanding of the physics and is using the understanding of the physics what's happening. Now, in the first step, and that is what I'm mostly going to uh, explain today, the statistical data analysis instead is somewhat new. We are trying to use statistics, in particular spatial correlation, to extract uh, coherent uh, data. In uh, more even general terms, as you will see, really the first step is some sense is the discovery, the data discovery. That gets again closer to the big data uh, problems. As you will see, actually, we first uh, took some blind alleys because we didn't look at the data or we didn't listen to the data carefully. Uh, we use, used our uh, conventional uh, uh, blind sides and we misinterpreted what we were seeing. So there is a lot of data discovery, if you want, of sciences there. Then the next step is what we do in our day job is uh, going from a coherent experiment or virtual experiment to estimation of parameters uh, using uh, some kind of uh, large scale inverse theory. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a somewhat definite is less relevant really to the big data and to today discussion. Now, I will run very quickly about the history of uh, uh, passive seismic interferometry because I think that is uh, quite interesting how sometimes science goes uh, through detours. It was actually first hypothesized by John Klaubart here at Stanford in exploration seismology in the 60s. Uh, we never had the sensor to do anything useful with it. And actually, the helio seismologists did something useful at NASA and at Stanford, starting, I believe, in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, then, uh, I have to say, uh, 
really hurting our pride of uh, reflection seismologists, the global seismologists did something useful uh, using uh, uh, their arrays. And uh, uh, they, uh, they did, uh, this is uh, shown in 2005, uh, the first example of, of tomography using interferometry. And here is a little bit of history instead of doing dense array uh, industry ones. And uh, we, we, actually, we saw it coming, we tried. We got data from companies to try to do it. But uh, as I said, the blind sides were, uh, were uh, I mean, our own fault, we failed. Uh, we were basically looking at uh, the wrong wave modes. We were looking for what we used every day, that are body waves and reflections, while instead most of the energy was in the surface waves. We looked at the wrong frequencies. We looked at uh, uh, the 5 to 25, 40, 100 hertz that we are accustomed to use. Instead, a lot of the signal was in the lower frequency. So uh, the good news is the student that did that uh, ended up graduating. Uh, his uh, thesis was inspired by interferometry, but was not about really interferometry. And then I got assured that he is a very perseverant, sometimes stubborn student. And he said, I want to make it work. And he came here. We looked at the data, uh, same data, some different data. And indeed, he produced in around 2010 the first reservoir scale uh, images from size interferometry. Now, where is the data discovery? I'm showing the next few movies. Uh, this is the frequency band that we are used to look at. And if you look at that uh, frequency band, you have a lot of noise coming from the platforms. This is a producing field. And actually, some noise coming from nearby fields. These are active surveys that the contaminate arrive there uh, 30, 40 kilometers away, but they do contaminate our data. Even if we go at lower frequency, we're still getting a lot of uh, platform noise. We needed to go to even lower frequency that we are not accustomed to look at to start to have uh, uh, pure noise or noise that actually we could use, at least in a relatively simple way with simple correlation. So this is lower frequency, and this is even uh, lower frequencies. So frequency was important. Understanding what the uh, Earth was telling us was important, and also the wave modes. Uh, the next few slides uh, depict for the non seismologists what are surface waves. In this case, are actually interface waves, be interface between the ocean bottom and the water column. Uh, there are main two wave modes. The, uh, on Earth, they are called the Rayleigh's waves. Uh, on uh, ocean bottom, they are called Shorty waves and Love waves. And I um, have a few movies here to give you a sense that actually, if you live in the Bay Area or a Navy, uh, like we have, a few miles away from the San Andreas, these are the ways that you need to fear. Uh, these are the ways that first they shook you up and down pretty badly. Uh, these are the shorty waves. And uh, uh, the next one are the love waves that they are the one that uh, shake you left to right in your building and uh, may make the real damage. In this case, they are actually useful to, to uh, basically see something in the subsurface that otherwise we cannot see. Now, the statistical tool that we use is very basic. It is cross-correlation, spatial cross-correlation between uh, 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 the sensors. In uh, 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 seismologies, we believe in spatial heterogeneities and uh, in stationarity with time, at least within the time span of the experiment. So uh, we try to uh, not to be uh, sophisticated in the spatial correlation. You can have a higher order correlations, and people have tried. But we believe basically in simple uh, first order correlations. But we do believe in redundancy of time. And that will actually help us to extract signal out of the noise. So we do spatial correlation between every uh, 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 sensors, any every, every, every other sensor. And from there, uh, we can basically create a virtual experiment that uh, give us as if we had a, a source at that point. And that's for every point in, uh, on the array. So that fact that we can do for every point in the array is the one that allows us to estimate the heterogeneities in uh, the uh, subsurface. And this is one of those uh, virtual sources. And as the movie goes on, that virtual sources will keep uh, moving in different location, because you can indeed do that uh, for every location. Now, uh, we use that uh, also for the stationarity, at least within uh, the few hours 
of the subsurface to uh, average over time. So this is the result between two sources, uh, two receivers, is a correlation now average over time. And you see that from basically no signals, a lot of noise, slowly we converge to something that is actually a uh, signal. Uh, Schur did a very sophisticated statistical analysis there. And depends on the field condition, we can get good data every six hours, 24 hours. And that allows now to monitor changes in the subsurface with the time scales in the six hour, 24 hours. Nothing that with active survey will be economical. We cannot go back and uh, shoot another active sur service within that time frame. But sometimes important phenomena happen with that time frame in the subsurface. That was just two sensors. This is a set of sensors. Same things as you average uh, longer and longer. Now uh, out of the noise uh, comes out uh, the signal. And uh, uh, this is one of those virtual sources. This just introduced the concept of the distance between source and the uh, receiver that we call offset. Just to compare uh, the uh, uh, data collected or synthesized from the noise to the active data. The left is the active data. It's much richer. Uh, those things that we uh, every day use are the reflection body waves. They are there. That's what we were first looking uh, when uh, we looked at this data. But what we have been reliably being able to get are the surface waves that do exist at higher frequency in the active data. But uh, these are the ones collected uh, uh, from uh, the passive data. One thing that you will see here is that different frequency travel at different speed. The lower frequencies tend to, to come uh, earlier. And indeed, uh, uh, that can be done what we call dispersion analysis. This apparent velocity is a function of frequency. But just to tell you that is actually because we have that phenomena, uh, uh, we can investigate not just the surface, but down, down in depth. That phenomena of uh, frequency dispersion allows us to have some uh, uh, depth resolution. So these are surface waves, radio waves in particular, propagating a low frequency on the top and a higher frequency on the bottom. You see the low frequency investigate much deeper than the higher frequency. So that is what allows us basically some uh, depth resolution. So far, I have been really talking about uniform data. From a big data point of view, the statistics what was uh, somewhat interesting. But uh, really, we don't have so far multi-parameter data. In reality, our sensors, they do have multi-component sensing. So you start to uh, be able to actually to do a multi-parameter analysis. Compared to some of what has, is done on, on uh, web data, is fairly trivial or simple. But we can start to uh, think about, again, as, uh, the, uh, uh, the different uh, components of the seismic sensors. We can, again, interpret them physically in terms of shorty waves and lab waves, as is the big depicted in this diagram. But you can start to think about doing more sophisticated data analytics on uh, these uh, different uh, sensors. So that is uh, the first move towards more, if you want, uh, big data, at least in the way that I understand it, uh, the way that Jeff was showing the big book uh, uh, about uh, an hour ago. Uh, as we will see, uh, also the next step will be actually different physical measurements. And I will mention that in a short while. So uh, now, uh, we good news is that we had the active uh, seismic survey to ground truth what we are getting. You know, we tend to be skeptical. It's nice to see nice patterns and nice figures, as Margot pointed out, and claim that reality. Uh, but whenever you talk with statistical methods, that is very dangerous. The good news here is those arrays were also collecting active data and give us much more reliable information. And here is a comparison of the different uh, death slides on the right uh, uh, obtained from active serving and pretty sophisticated and expensive, computation intensive uh, uh, processing and imaging with the frequency slices uh, of the group velocity maps that I was saying. And different frequency tells us about different depth. And of course, the active sensing has much higher resolution. But we do see the similar features from the active sensing and uh, the uh, passive one. So that is a snapshot, is the st static images. Our important uh, confirmation was the fact that we can monitor changes over time. And again, here uh, it helped to confirm that 
the fact that uh, the active sensing was being done every few months for many years in a row, and uh, we had uh, passive data for different years. So these now are differential images, are changes in seismic velocity. And if you look, look at the scale bars, we are talking about small ones in the order of 1-2%. But we can sense those 1-2% changes in seismic velocity. And again, the general pattern is confirmed from what was uh, extracted using the active sensing. We can not only find the uh, velocity, but we can also uh, estimate the uh, change of velocity with the direction of propagation. We call that seismic anisotropy. One of the arrays uh, was collected on a field that uh, has strong uh, uh, subsidence. Basically, the bottom of the ocean is going down, is uh, uh, creating differential stresses at the uh, uh, near surface. And as such, those differential stresses uh, makes the, the seismic wave propagating in different directions, uh, sorry, at different velocity in different directions. On the bottom here is uh, a gradient of the bathymetry uh, of the ocean bottom. And on the right is a display of the seismic anisotropy. The length of the little vectors is the amount of anisotropy. And the direction is the fast velocity of the seismic velocity. And uh, this map here correlates incredibly well with the differential bathymetry on the left. And it correlates with our understanding of the way that this anisotropy is induced by the sub subsidence in uh, the ocean floor. So we can take different snapshots, looking at differential changes, and also more, uh, uh, more than just velocity. We look at uh, changes in stress and potential fracturing in uh, the reservoir using passive data. So uh, that is the conclusion of uh, uh, my uh, uh, reservoir, reservoir sc scale imaging uh, and uh, uh, monitoring. We can uh, estimate seismic uh, P and S velocity. That tells us a lot about fluid flows and changing uh, of the fluid flow patterns in the subsurface. We can estimate seismic anisotropy that uh, tells us about stress fields and changes in uh, stress fields and in rock deformation. As I said, it seems that we can extract useful information with a time frequency of uh, six hours, 24 hours. Uh, and so we can see a uh, very fine and temporal scale, at least in the scale of uh, uh, subsurface changes, and we can be a continuous monitoring. Today, in, uh, for the fields that justify for active surveying putting those expensive uh, uh, permanent sensors, the uh, monitoring by passive uh, uh, seismic is uh, justified uh, because the additional cost is minimal. And we may uh, actually extract very useful information for managing the reservoir, avoid uh, environmental disasters. Uh, and so that is really uh, uh, something that can be done, at least for the fields that already have permanent sensors. And there are more and more fields that are instrumented with permanent sensors all over the world, both on land and uh, in the ocean. Tomorrow, as uh, the sensor technology keeps improving, uh, and uh, gets cheaper and cheaper, it, I think that it is conceivable that uh, a permanent sensor may be deployed just for the sake of a passive uh, seismic to monitor in a cost-effective way the changes going on in the subsurface. So uh, that was uh, one, uh, if you want, industry application. I do think that uh, uh, probably in the near future, uh, even one that may have an even more impact, and companies are working actively on that, is for really helping to optimize and minimize environmental impact of the uh, shale gas and oil revolution of uh, uh, fracking and hydrofracking. One of probably of the uh, basic technology that is going to, I believe, a lot of impacts is uh, this idea that uh, you can deploy fiber optics uh, and uh, get sensors out of this fiber optic very uh, densely and not expensively. So this, in, uh, for seismic, we will have distributed acoustic sensors, or DAS. These uh, fiber optics, they can go uh, up to 30, 40 kilometers long. You can have a sensor every meter. 
So here again, the big data uh, coming and the kind of density that we like to sample uh, our wave fields. And even more intriguing, they are uh, very flexible. So uh, really, the configuration of your array is somewhat up to your imagination and uh, of the tools that you have to deploy them. So you can uh, be really creative in the way that you deploy this, uh, uh, those uh, uh, arrays. And the good news is that they're cheap. So uh, companies are considering of basically putting by default when uh, they complete the wells. They put in every single well, and uh, it may be uh, collecting passive data or maybe active data, uh, but uh, uh, really the economics might be there. Now, on the big data uh, and the analytics side, the uh, interesting and intriguing part is that this same uh, uh, fibers will be able to collect temperature data as well as pressure data. So here we have not only multi-component seismic, but different physical data uh, that can be correlated with each other. So there is a lot of data discovery, a, a lot of uh, uh, interesting statistics, understanding the physical phenomenon and the application that can happen out of this data uh, uh, that is in the future. Now, uh, the last couple of minutes, I would like just to talk about the uh, earthquake application. Uh, I have uh, a slide that Greg uh, gave me, I think, for further questions. I really will uh, be right to, to you during uh, uh, the, uh, the break that is coming. This is his slide. And I think uh, that actually he is using more sophisticated uh, statistics that we have been using uh, that are one that I will be familiar with some of the data an analytics expert in which uh, basically is trying to deal with the problem that not only there is a large amount of data, but uh, the information is useful if analysis is done in seconds. We are custom in seismic imaging using tens of thousands of uh, uh, processors for months to get out an image. You cannot uh, afford to do that if you want an early warning for an earthquake. So they do need to uh, apply much more sophisticated statistics to be able to uh, basically extract and uh, distinguish what is other seismic noise and uh, actually serious earthquake that is uh, hitting you in that area. And uh, uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, mostly all the people uh, in the companies that gave us uh, uh, the data sets that I've showed you the result, that were short thesis and in particular were BP for one of the data and uh, Conoco Phillips for the other data. I would like again to uh, thank Steve for inviting me and all of you for listening. And I will be very happy to uh, have any question. Hey, uh, Trevor DeMeo with Chevron. Very good presentation. I guess I had a question on one of your pre last slides where you talked about using these distributed sensors to reduce the number of um, hydraulic fracturing well, well jobs and potentially reducing water usage. So just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how you propose to do that. Oh, I should say that uh, I'm not a microseismic expert, as I said, so that is what I see going around me. So all what my comments come from educated laymen, if you want. Uh, they, uh, I think that one way of understanding uh, the fracturing process and how that releases uh, hydrocarbons, that has uh, been proven, even if not, I would say that is a standard tool, but is very much deployed is identifying the uh, uh, micro-seismic events that are generated uh, in correlation with uh, hydrofracking. And that helps you to understand where you may want to uh, frack your formation and where instead it may be not worthwhile to do it because not many hydrocarbon will produce for that particular uh, area with those conditions. So that is where uh, you may uh, save wells or if you have already your wells where you do have your sensors, you may say, save the same of that hydrofracking that indeed uh, uh, need a lot of fresh water and produce a lot of wastewater, and for which actually there is a problem of induced seismicity that is another interesting twist between uh, unconventional uh, oil and gas and seismology 
for which, again, uh, there is a group of my colleagues that have started just very recently an industrial consortium. And again, Greg will be able to tell you more about that. Uh, Sven Krüger with Baker Hughes. I think very, very interesting presentation. The question I have on this example that, that you put on the, on the screen here again, uh, you touched on this briefly. And in fact, what we have seen images that come from, from the dust and uh, from geophones are matching surprisingly well. Um, how active are you in this area? How much work have you done um, related to big data and distributed acoustic sensing? I not done uh, much of it, uh, but I will very much interested to get into it because I do think that uh, the kind of expertise that we have uh, in uh, more conventional reflection seismology dealing with not only large data, but large data coming from dense arrays with many different kinds of shapes and forms uh, has a lot of relevance together with better understanding the data analytics with our colleagues in the statistics department or other part of Stanford, I think that's really you need to put together those two fields that traditionally have not been together to get the best out of that kind of uh, DAS or DAT data. So uh, as I said, uh, I'm very much willing to learn. And uh, I have a lot of bright students that uh, they can uh, really long. I've got a technical question. I know nothing about your field, but it looked like you were uh, filtering down to those low um, uh, frequencies to to dodge noise that was contaminating your data set. And a question when you do that, um, obviously you're throwing away information. Is the real phenomenon limited to the to those frequency bands that got through those filters so that you really have sufficient information to work with. Another related question is, um, obviously there's a real strong signal if they're doing a contaminant from one of these other active uh, things. Um, we've had good luck in other fields of monitoring that signal and then being able to subtract it out, but then basically still get to use that portion of the spectrum um, that uh, from first blush would appear to be contaminated. We can, you can get rid of the contaminating signal using more sophisticated techniques. That Thomas. is an excellent question, but uh, it has many facets to answer. Uh, let me first talking about uh, the low frequency signal. Uh, that has to do not only with the noise, but with the nature of the of generate, generated energy. Uh, yeah, that frequency spectrum is mostly generated actually by ocean waves uh, interfering with each other and pounding on the seafloor and is actually can go even at lower frequencies. Uh, global seismologists that have uh, se uh, seismometers that can go well below the one hertz, very much longer period that have been using them. There is not much of that energy at uh, higher frequencies. So there is a part of, uh, of the kind of what the signal is. However, uh, I have not lost hopes to find body waves in that data. And actually, uh, I should have said, and I'm going to say now, one of the uh, uh, posters that are going to be shown later, I think, this morning, is by a student of mine and a postdoc in the department, looking with a different, uh, slightly different kind of data on land, looking for higher frequency and uh, body waves. So we are still searching for that, because those uh, interrogates the Earth way down kilometers, not just the first few hundred meters. And uh, uh, I have a few hypotheses that I would like to, uh, to test with the data that we have, a potential with additional data, where we eventually find some of body waves created by different mechanisms on, uh, in the Earth. And I'm quite familiar. A uh, uh, few decades ago, my background is uh, EE and signal processing, so I think that I'm quite familiar with uh, all the uh, array processing techniques, at least with some of the array processing techniques, that have been used in uh, active seismology as well, because we do have many interfering noise as well. But excellent question. Are you doing any work to characterize these seismic patterns and relate them to physical phenomena like your ocean waves as a certain seismic pattern, and then being able to reverse that out of your 
big seismic jung jungle there? In some cases, yes. So that is the case of the microseismic, for example. So uh, while we are using the, uh, let's say, quarter to hertz, two hertz energy propagating the Earth to estimate parameters in the subsurface, so we don't somewhat care about the physical. I mean, it needs to be there, but the physical phenomena generating the energy is not our primary objective. The microseismic case uh, is indeed uh, is the one of the principal objective is characterizing the uh, physical phenomenon creating the waves that in this case are these smaller earthquakes that are induced by hydrofracking uh, the formation for, to produce oil and gas. And uh, the uh, physical characteristic of that uh, seismic source, it does help actually to understand the stresses in the subsurface and the help uh, uh, minimizing wells, minimizing flood jobs, optimizing production. So it can work both ways, depends really on the particular situation. And that, I think, it does illuminate what I think is crucial, at least for, for physical sensors. You need to have a domain expert that understands the physics or the chemistry or whatever you're looking at, as well as the data analytics people that helps you to have more sophisticated uh, data analytics tools to, uh, to look at your data. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks again.